Well, it gives me great pleasure today to be in front of you and talk about the important progress that has been made in the field of HIV vaccines. One doesn't give an overview talk without the help of an enormous number of people who play an essential role in the HIV vaccine field. I want to especially acknowledge my colleagues and collaborators in the HVTN, the HIV Vaccine Trials Network. A special thanks to Glenda Gray, my co-PI, head of the South African Medical Research Council for her incredible work on HIV vaccines in South Africa. And a couple thanks for a couple key members of the IAS leadership, Chris Byer, an original member of the HVTN who is a major advisor in our global policy and strategy, and Linda Gale Becker, a critical site um, PI of the HVTN. But most of all, I want to th acknowledge Tony Fauci. Tony has been the person who has been the single greatest supporter of HIV vaccines globally. He is the person who I've had the pleasure of working closely with nearly every week of every year, and I want to acknowledge him both as a leader and as a friend. This picture is as I see him, reflective, sitting in his office, albeit I am usually the one on this couch, and it's him who's in the chair opposite the couch giving me psychotherapy. Now, onto the talk. Though great inroads have been made in HIV therapy and some preventive modalities, we are here together to demonstrate that HIV is still the world's most pressing global health issue. In the US, we have 45,000 new cases yearly, and globally, more than 2 million new infections per year. Frankly, just a stunning number. In the US, we are still having outbreaks of HIV. This one is in Scott County, a small rural county in Indiana that accrued over 160 cases of HIV over a three-month period of time, essentially all related to intravenous substance use. I think we must all acknowledge we are a long ways away from what any epidemiologist would consider an AIDS-free generation. Now we have over the last decade had wonderful additions to our HIV prevention toolbox as outlined here in the slide borrowed from Tony. ARVs for PrEP, PMCC, treatment as prevention, medical male circumcision, and some progress in the microbicide field. All of these approaches can make a difference. But there are caveats. Although many of these prevention strategies have high efficacy in clinical trials, the ability to saturate communities with these interventions for real-world effectiveness and hence the long-term effects on population-based incidents are unclear. Do not construe that I am saying that they do not all deserve support and increased uptake. Test and treat is very effective at the individual level. And as we begin the Herculean effort to get more people on treatment, maybe, eventually, we will see population-based effects. But with asymptomatic acquisition, prolonged subclinical infection, and sexual transmission, getting to what I would consider for my grandchildren to be an AIDS-free generation, which is less than 2,500 cases a year in the U.S. and less than 100,000 cases globally, in other words, a 95% reduction from currency areas or concurrent numbers. That kind of control will only be achieved with an effective and potent vaccine, one that is widely distributed and durable. And this article concurs in that belief. Now, there are two major scientific questions facing the HIV vaccine field. The first, is can non-neutralizing antibodies be induced in high enough magnitude, high enough duration, and quality to achieve the desired minimum useful efficacy of a vaccine, a 50% reduction in acquisition for at least two to three years? Can we do this by designing better recombinant proteins, ones that, for example, enhance antibodies to the V1, V2 loop, as I will discuss in a minute, and then by employing novel adjuvants or eliciting helper T cell responses that enhance the function and durability of these non-neutralizing antibodies. The second issue is can broadly neutralizing antibodies achieve protection? The importance of broadly reactive neutralizing antibodies in preventing HIV acquisition is perhaps the most widely believed gospel in the HIV vaccine field. However, there are examples within viral diseases, one that I, ones that I work on, such as HSV and CMV, that have shown that vaccines that elicit neutralization in in vitro assays that we think should work do not actually reduce acquisition of these infections. In other words, in vitro neutralization does not always mean in vivo efficacy. 
These two ideas of non-neutralizing and neutralizing antibodies are not mutually exclusive, but defining their truth is central to developing effective HIV vaccines. Now a bit of history. At the time of the last Durban conference, HIV vaccines were not even on the main stage of the conference. There were no vaccine trials in South Africa as HIV denialism was center stage politically. Many phase one trials with recombinant proteins were being performed in the United States and a phase one vaccine trial was underway in Uganda. Almost all candidate vaccines were recombinant HIV-1 envelope proteins. Unfortunately, all of these products, they were GP-160, 145, 120, while eliciting antibodies, they were very narrow in their neutralizing effects. Many didn't even recognize their related sibling viruses, let alone a first degree cousin. The first efficacy trials of an HIV vaccine, the VaxGen trials, were not reported until 2003, two and a half years post-Durban. I'm obviously here on the podium because these recombinant proteins failed to reduce acquisition, either in men who have sex with men or in IDU trials. Now, post-VaxGen, the HIV field turned to the concept of T-cell-based vaccines. CD8 T-cells were what differentiated elite controllers from progressors, or so the dogma was at the time. And there was hope that vaccines could induce T-cell responses that would be effective in either reducing acquisition or post-acquisition viral load. The hypothesis was a simple one. The more potent the T-cell response, the better the vaccine. Now, developing such vaccines occurred quickly. A series of phase one studies showed that recombinant replication defective adenovirus serotype 5 vectors were the most potent in inducing CD8 T cell responses. And these recombinant AD5 vectors moved rapidly through the clinical trial system and efficacy trials were initiated in 2004. The AD5 gag paul neff vaccine was te tested in the STEP and FIMBILI trials and in 2010, the DNA AD5 vector combination in HVTN505. The latter was a 10 component vaccine, a true manufacturing tour de force. However, neither AD5 approach worked. For the STEP trial, we actually showed a trend for more acquisitions in the vaccinated group. Curiously, only in uncircumcised men. For the HVTN505 trial, there was no efficacy and fortunately no evidence of enhancement. The reasons for the discrepancies have never been fully defined and are likely related to the importance of including HIV-1 envelope antigen in the HVTN505 trial, and the importance of having functional antibodies to offset any immune enhancement that activated T cells play in the genital and rectal mucosa. So there appears to be a yin and yang between immune responses that are protective and immune responses that actually enhance infection, and a candidate vaccine regimen may elicit both types of responses, and understanding this complexity is critical to find a maximally effective vaccine regimen. Now, a cloud lifted over the HIV vaccine field in September of 2009 with the announcement of the results of the RV144 trial, an HIV vaccine efficacy trial taking place in Thailand in which protection against acquisition was met with a canary pox vector prime and a recombinant GP120 boost. The trial was an operational tour de force, 16,000 people in a low incidence population. And the results were met with some surprise and frankly some skepticism. T cell priming with ALVAC was modest, I often call it the quiet vector. And the GP120 used was identical to that which failed in the IDU trial. But data are data. And this regimen exhibited substantial efficacy, 60% in the first 12 months, which then, over time, reduced to an overall efficacy of 31% over a 33 and a half year period of time. There then, post RV144, there was an impressive scientific effort to understand how did the RV144 regimen work. It was led by Bart Haynes, Julie McElrath, Peter Gilbert, Nelson Michael, and Susan Zolan Pasner. And these studies on immune responses that were associated with vaccine efficacy have led us to where we are to the, today. The RV144 trial also pivoted the field from concentrating on novel vectors to understanding it's what you put in the vector. The structure of the envelope antigen in and of itself 
that is critical for vaccine design. And it's the studies that are now ongoing are direct descendants of this correlate work. First, there was no direct correlation between neutralizing antibodies and HIV-1 acquisition in RV-144. In fact, none of the sera from the RV-144 vaccinees neutralized the panel of 20 contemporaneous isolates of HIV-1 circulating in Thailand. There were, however, very significant correlations related to the magnitude and the epitope specificity of non-neutralizing antibodies, antibodies that were functional in binding or infected cell assays that we call ADCC or ADCP, sort of a killing assay looking at monocytes, macrophages, or neutrophils. Now, one of the strongest and surprising findings was that antibodies to a conserved region of the V1, V2 loop, a region that was almost completely ignored in the past by the HIV vaccine field, were highly correlated with vaccine efficacy. These antibodies peaked during the time of best vaccine efficacy, and the waning of these antibodies was associated with reduced acquisition. And the association between high V1, V2 antibodies and vaccine efficacy is shown in the bottom part of this graph. It's almost linear, high titers having almost 70% efficacy. Of major importance, genetic alterations in the infecting strains of HIV were also observed in the crown of the V2 loop, where the vaccine immune responses were directed telling us that immunity induced by the vaccine made the virus, shall we say, uneasy, putting pressure on it. Another interesting aspect that emerged from the studies is that both distracting and inhibitory antibodies could be produced that reduce vaccine efficacy. For RV144, these were serum IgA antibodies, the GP120, that inhibited ADCC activity. And for HVTN505, these distracting antibodies were directed at GP41 which was a cross-reacting antibody to an E. coli protein. And that actually appears to occur in natural infection also. And defining and eliminating these distracting antibodies is an issue we need to understand better. Importantly, in RV144, there was an independent association between vaccine efficacy and the frequency of polyfunctional T cell helper responses to HIV envelope especially CD4-positive T cells that in ex vivo assay secreted IL-2, TNF-alpha, CD4 to ligand, and IL-4. These are cytokines that influence antibody development. These observations were discovered through a novel computational biological approach designed by Rafael Gattardo and David Lin at the Hutchinson Center in the HVTN. It's a mouthful. Combinatorial polyfunctional analysis of single said subsets, COMPASS. As shown in this immunological heat map, the frequency of vaccinated persons who were protected from HIV was much more common among persons whose envelope-specific T cells produced four or five cytokines as compared to those who produced only a limited cytokine array. This association between T cell polyfunctionality and vaccine efficacy was as strong as that of the V1, V2 antibody response. So we walk away from the RV144 trial, Correlate's work, with a series of hypotheses about non-neutralizing antibodies and polyfunctional envelope-specific CD4 T cell responses and how to enhance them as a means of furthering HIV-1 efficacy. These concepts have led us to where we are today with what I will call three novel strategies that are being pursued in the field of HIV vaccine development. Two of them evaluate two separate approaches of non-neutralizing antibodies as the underlying concept for vaccine efficacy and the third is to evaluate the issue of whether neutralizing antibodies can be a more effective approach for the prevention of HIV-1 acquisition. The first program post RV-144 was a public-private partnership affectionately called P5, involving Novartis, now GSK, Sanofi Pasteur, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the NIH, the HVTN, the South African Medical Research Council, that's all a mouthful, and to build upon the RV144 concept and utilize the ALVAC recombinant GP120 approach to tackle the HIV epidemic in Sub-Saharan Africa. The strategy was to insert a clade C HIV envelope into the ALVAC vector, to increase the depth of the antibody responses to clade C viruses by constructing a bivalent GP120 pr protein and adjuvanting that with MF59, a more potent B cell adjuvant than alum. There's a plan to give a booster dose at 12 months to increase the durability of the immune response and hopefully sustain the early vaccine efficacy seen in RV144. The P5 program has organized three studies, 
The first was to evaluate the RV144 vaccine itself in South Africans to make sure South Africans responded to the vector GP120 combination. This study called HVTN097 led by Glenda Gray was presented a year ago and sh showed superb immune responses by South Africans. The next trial was to test the safety of the clade C regimens constructed for the P5 partnership itself called HVTN100. This study led by Linda Gale Becker was presented at yesterday at the conference as a late breaker. The clade C regimen has produced both higher binding antibody titers than in RV144, as shown in this slide. HVTN100 data are in the green and the RV144 data are in blue. And in the next slide, which shows better CD4 T cell polyfunctionality in the HIV envelope to HIV envelope antigen in HVTN100 on the left and RV144 on the right. With these data in hand, we are in the midst of starting the third clinical trial under the P5 rubric, a multinational, multi-site, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial to evaluate the safety and efficacy of ALVAC bivalent clade C vaccine in preventing HIV infection in adults in South Africa. This trial, which we call HVTN702, is scheduled to start November 1st of this year in South Africa. Glenda Gray, Linda Gale Becker, Fatima Lehrer, and Muku Malalela are the study co-chairs and co-chairs. Yes, it's women power here. <clears throat> We're happy with that. HVTN 702 will enroll 5,400 people, 2,700 in the vaccine arm and 2,700 in the placebo arm. An evaluation will be initially for 24 months of follow-up, and then if it meets criteria, will be extended to stage two, which is an additional 12 months or 36 months of follow-up for the entire study. The injection regimen is similar to that of RV144 with a booster at month 12 to augment durability. Now, besides the P5 program, the last few years have seen the rapid development of what is now a Johnson & Johnson pharmaceutical-led collaboration outlined by the partners listed on this slide. This program is also built upon non-neutralizing and CD4 T cell responses using a recombinant replication defective AD26 serotype vector. What is more unique about this approach is that the HIV genes inserted into the AD26 vector are mosaic antigens, that is, synthesized genes that span the T cell antigens of all the circulating strains of HIV. This T cell priming agent is then boosted with a recombinant trimeric envelope protein for improved humoral immunity, sort of component number three on this slide. This regimen has achieved significant protection in non-human primate studies and has entered phase one trials in both South Africa as well as in the United States. The initial immunogenicity results will not be available until later this year. And if they look good and pass a similar kind of go, no go criteria as HVTN 100, a phase 2B test of concept trial will be undertaken. Now the last concept I want to discuss is the pursuit of neutralizing antibodies as a way of preventing HIV infection. There is a wonderful long history of using antibodies to treat infectious diseases and this slide borrowed from John Muscola outlines its history and shows that several Nobel Prizes between 1901 to 1987 have been given for the use of antibodies to prevent or treat infectious diseases. Now much of the work in discovering and defining the epitope specificities of broadly neutralizing antibodies to HIV come from the desire to utilize this information for the design of immunogens to elicit such responses. And in the last six years, a whole swath of human monoclonal antibodies have been cloned from HIV-infected persons and their sites of activity mapped, as illustrated on this slide. The ones that have achieved the most attention have been those that are directed at the CD4 binding site of HIV, an antibody that inhibits almost all HIV um, isolates. A prototype of these human CD4 binding antibodies called VRCO1 inhibits about 90% of isolates in in vitro assays with a mean IC50 of one microgram. Interestingly, the antibody is concentrated by the neonatal FC gamma receptor onto the mucosal surfaces in, in non-human primates and hence appear to line the mucosal membranes of the genital tract. This is shown for the antibody in the middle upper panel 
and the co-localization with the FC neonatal gamma receptor in the lower panels of the slide. Now these observations are of importance as recent evidence from Dan Baruch's lab show that antibodies can inhibit HIV even after attachment and entry into the regional lymph nodes. It's not just sopping up virus in the mucosal surface or um, mucosal cavity. That VRCO1 antibody can persist in the mucosa is a desirable trait. In non-human primate experimental channel models, passive installation of VRCO1 prior to challenge protects against mucosal infection, both rectally and vaginally. That said, these passive antibody protection studies in non-human primates tell us that physiological achievable levels of antibody can prevent HIV infection in monkeys. But to my knowledge, we're not trying to make a vaccine for monkeys. We're trying to make it for humans. Thus, what is needed is to extend these non-human primate trials to humans. What concentrations of VRCO1 antibody are needed to prevent HIV acquisition? Can we convert this monoclonal antibody level to a serum level of neutralization so we can define what neutralizing titers are required to define protection in humans? Such a finding would be a landmark benchmark for defining what concentrations of other types of broadly neutralizing antibodies would be required to be effective. It would provide a real target for future image and design and vaccine development and would also serve as a benchmark for the non-human primate challenge models, both for vaccines and antibody-related studies. So we have coined a new phrase for this work, antibody-mediated prevention, or AMP. The VRC1 program has progressed rapidly, and a phase 2b study to determine if passively infused monoclonal antibodies can prevent HIV infection in high-risk adults is now in progress. This study is currently ongoing. In the AMP studies, VRC01 is given by IV infusion every two months. There are two separate, separate populations being enrolled, 2,400 MSM and transgendered men in North and South America, and 1,500 women in Sub-Saharan Africa. Both trials opened in April and May of 2016, and as of this week, over 300 people are currently enrolled in the trials. The rationale for the two populations is that we suspect that the effects of antibody may vary with the route of acquisition. And in addition, the variation in doses allows us to more precisely define what are the optimal concentrations of neutralizing activity associated with protection from acquisition of HIV. Moreover, there are huge economic differences between the 30 milligram per kilogram versus 10 milligram per kilogram doses over an extended pipe period. Now, the initial phase one evaluation, peak levels of almost 600 micrograms of antibody are achieved with a 30 milligram per kilogram dose, which is on the left-hand panel of this slide. The concentration then declines over eight weeks to around 30 micrograms per ml. The IC80 is one microgram. The 10 milligram per kilogram dose shown on the right-hand panel produces a peak concentration of around 300 micrograms, which then declines to around three micrograms per ml. The overlapping concentrations shown where the colors overlap are seen about 60% of the days between the Q8 week concentrations. The concept of giving an antibody IV is obviously a proof of concept approach. We recognize this and appreciate how this idea has been embraced by our research communities in the US, South America, and Africa. It has been gratifying to see that effective communities understand the need to define just how well and whether this approach will work and understand if it does work, it is a breakthrough in HIV prevention and vaccine development. Defining the optimal concentration of efficacy allows us to engineer this eventual product and delivery system that will provide protection levels in a way that can be efficient and cost effective. The hope is that concentrations that can be given subcutaneously or in a depot method every few months or even by gene delivery in a muscle that could pump out antibody for years. On a population basis, we expect that antibodies, which are naturally occurring substances, will be safe and effective for extended periods of time. And that I would say as an advocate of this approach, as safe or safer than any small molecule. Antibodies also have the potential role for interruption of maternal child transmission, both at delivery as well as to provide long-term protection during the course of breastfeeding. <laughs>
So in this pictorial history of HIV vaccine development that I've been flashing in front of you throughout this talk, we are finally moving the needle forward with human efficacy trials that are commensurate with the need for developing an HIV vaccine. It's not that our phase one program has been useless for society. In fact, it's the HIV vaccine program that has made possible for rapidly developed the platforms that have moved forward with Ebola and Zika. The DNA, VZV, AD26, and MVA vectors that are being used in candidate vaccines for these diseases all started with the HIV vaccine program as outlined in these studies. In ending, I hope I have conveyed that the HIV vaccine is, shall we say, vaccine field is open for business. We are, as a field, conducting three very important clinical efficacy trials that unfold this year. Two trials are defining it enhancing non-neutralizing antibodies by enhancing the adjuvant in, in the regimen or by enhancing CD4 T cell responses that can induce an appropriate vaccine efficacy to be clinically useful. The third trial uses passively instilled broadly neutralizing antibodies to define whether such antibodies offer the potential every card-carrying virologist feels they should. The focus of these trials is on the clade C epidemic, a marked shift from candidate vaccines constructed a decade ago that were almost all directed at clade B. These studies will set the stage for the entire design and development field for the next decade. It's the use of proof of concept trials in humans associated with state of the art laboratory and computational science that constitute true rational vaccine design. And for the first time, the science agenda of HIV vaccine development is going to be based on human clinical trials rather than just experimental preclinical studies. Now, in ending, I'd like to again acknowledge my colleagues in the HVTN and people who helped with the talk, especially Scott Hamburg, Glenda Gray, Jim Kublin, my colleagues at Sanofi Pasteur and Ed Jansen, and Julie McElrath and Peter Gilbert, Bart Haynes, Mary Marovich, Carl Diefenbach, and Mike Cohn. The last slides. The site investigators in, involved in the clinical trials in Africa and then the Americas. And while I have named many individuals who played a role in the HIV prevention and vaccine field, developing an HIV vaccine can only be done with the larger community that all of you represent today. The spectacular vac volunteers who participate in our studies, the community of advocates and the scientists and clinicians and colleagues around the world working on the front lines. On a personal note, I'll say, we are all sick of the magnitude and persistence of this epidemic. We need potent and durable interventions so that your family and my family, irrespective of color, sexual orientation, gender, economic situation, geography, or age, can be protected by an effective HIV vaccine. And it's me who thanks all of you for your dedication and perseverance. Thank you.